Hey guys, welcome to Mintcast. I'm your host, Manar Muhawish, founder and editor-in-chief of Mint Press News. In every crisis, there's an opportunity. And for America's top cheerleaders for war, including Mike Pompeo and Elliot Abrams, the coronavirus has been no exception. The Trump administration is capitalizing on the global pandemic by increasing pressure against sanctioned countries like Venezuela, Cuba, Iran, and Syria, adding to a long list of nations, including Russia, China, Nicaragua, and North Korea, that now represent a quarter of the world's population living under the brutality of U.S. imperialism and economic warfare. Now, despite being victims of a U.S. maximum pressure campaign, including decades of crippling sanctions, threats of war, and attempted coups through the funding of opposition groups, These victims of Washington's heavy-handed foreign policy are rising above the challenge to cope with coronavirus. Eight of these targeted nations have made an appeal to the international community. Penning a letter to the United Nations Secretary General, the UN's High Commissioner on Human Rights, and the Director General of the World Health Organization, calling for an end to the unilateral American economic blockade, calling U.S. sanctions illegal and a blatant violation of international law and the Charter of the United Nations. Now, I'm excited to introduce our guest for today, who I've been following for a while now. His name is Dan Kovalik, to help us understand the dynamics at play here. Dan is a human rights lawyer, journalist, and the author of many fantastic books, including his most recently published book, No More War, How the West Violates International Law by Using Humanitarian Intervention to Advance Economic and Strategic Interests. Dan, welcome to Mintcast. Thank you so much. Now, the truth is that sanctions kill. They are a form of collective punishment that is now preventing a quarter of the world's population from accessing medical supplies and aid at a time when the WHO has called on nations to unite in the face of COVID-19. Now, despite economic hardship, these same sanctioned nations have contributed immensely to the fight to contain the global pandemic, including Cuba who is sending thousands of doctors worldwide to provide free health care and assistance to nations coping with COVID-19 and developing a successful antiviral drug, Interferon Alpha 2B. So Dan, how does a tiny country like Cuba, against all odds, come to the rescue after having suffered crippling U.S. economic sanctions for decades? Yes, well, that is a great question, and it is a real success story. You know, Cuba has lived under a U.S. embargo now for about 60 years, and um, it's been very difficult uh, for that country, particularly after the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. The Soviet Union had had been a huge help uh, to Cuba, and they went through this period um, that was very difficult uh, there, um, in which they essentially had to learn to become self-sufficient in many ways, in terms of agriculture, in terms of medicine. You know, they they learn to make their own medicine. They have a great pharmaceutical industry now, uh, which makes medicine not just for themselves, but as you noted, for other countries uh, as well, including this drug, uh, which is being used to treat people uh, who have COVID-19. So, Cuba, because of the way that they are organized, um, have been able to overcome those sanctions. I mean, you know, with that said, I mean, it has to be pointed out the sanctions have hampered Cuba's, you know, uh, efforts in many ways, but uh, they have been resourceful. And in many ways, I think, and I've thought for a long time that Cuba, in many ways, is pointing the way towards how the rest of the world is going to have to adapt to survive. Uh, you know, they don't depend, uh, or, or they've had a lack of fossil fuels at various times. Um, they have had not had industrial fertilizer for a long time. So they're, now they're the only uh, 100% organic uh, agricultural country in the world. And in fact, the UN has declared they're the most sustainably developed country in the world. Some of that it has been, you know, a matter of adapting to these sanctions. Uh, but again, I think that they have what they've taught us is that uh, it, it's not so much 
how much resources you have, but how well you're able to distribute those resources and how well you're able um, you know, to use those resources. And it really is ama an amazing story, which we here in the U.S. can learn from. And so in my intro, I listed about eight countries that are sanctioned currently, and there's actually a lot more. Um, but I think for many people, there's some confusion about sanctions, that they believe that they're more of, you know, they're not actually an act of war. But can you explain to us how are sanctions an act of war and a form of collective punishment? And if you could, what is their standing in international law? Yes. Well, um, so first of all, under the UN Charter, which is essentially the constitution of international law, it's the constitution of the world, uh, only the UN Security Council can decide to use economic or military means to deal with issues of international peace and security. So really, it's only the Security Council of the UN that can impose the type of sanctions we're talking about. Uh, but the U.S., true to form, has decided that it can use uh, economic sanctions and even military means against other countries on its own, unilaterally, without seeking approval of the U.N. Security Council. Now, there's no basis in law for that. That's completely lawless, but that's the U.S. view, and that's how they act. And what these sanctions do, and I'll, I'll give the, the example of Venezuela, because I think I understand how the sanctions work there most of all. Um, they prevent countries like Venezuela from obtaining many life-saving and life-necessary supplies for their people. Uh, there was a very good report done on this. Uh, by the Center for Economic Policy Research, or CEPR. And uh, it was authored by two economists named Jeffrey Sachs and Mark Weisbrot. And what they showed is that o over just a one-year period between 2017 and 2018, uh, they estimated that 40,000 Venezuelans were killed as a direct result of sanctions. And they base this on the number of people who depended on life-saving drugs that Venezuela was being denied due to the sanctions. And those drugs include HIV drugs, insulin, chemotherapy medicines, dialysis equipment. Um, those are the things, and food. So those are the things that sanctions starve a country of. Obviously, um, those have uh, a likelihood, um, in fact, a certainty of killing people. And so this report estimated that in a one-year period, 40,000 Venezuelans died. They have not done an updated report, but they predicted that in the next year, 2019, that number of 40,000 would have only been increased in that year. And a UN expert named Dr. Alfred Desias, great guy, um, who, who cannot get on mainstream press, uh, but would love to, to talk about his conclusions. Um, he's estimated that at least 100,000 Venezuelans have died due to these sanctions. So these sanctions are intended to create maximum suffering amongst the civilian population of a country like Venezuela, like Iran, like Nicaragua, like Cuba, in an effort to convince or coerce the civilian population into withdrawing support for their government and, and, and into even possibly overthrowing their government. And so what you have is... Uh, intended suffering upon a civilian population to bring about a political end, which frankly is the textbook definition of terrorism. Um, but in addition, as you mentioned, this is a violation of the Geneva Conventions. 
of international humanitarian law because that law requires that even in times of war, and the, the, these countries are not, we're not at war with them, but even if we were under international humanitarian law, um, you're supposed to protect civilians. And it's illegal, even during wartime, to deny populations of food, of water, of medicine. This is explicit in international humanitarian law. And it's been the case uh, for over a hundred years that that's been a very specific part of international humanitarian law, dating back to the Hague Convention of 1907. And so this is very clearly uh, an illegal act that the U.S. is engaged in um, by imposing these types of sanctions uh, on these countries. And, you know, what's so interesting is, you know, you mentioned that this is intended when sanctions, you know, the sanctions are intended to create a frustration um, within a society so that they can eventually turn and blame their own government. And we see that so actively taking place in countries like Venezuela, like you mentioned Venezuela, where, you know, the opposition, they're so frustrated with the situation there, they're blaming their own government, whereas the reality is is that these sanctions have created a lot of this hardship and lack of access to um, this sort of medical aid, and it ends up empowering the opposition. Um, and same thing with uh, within Iran. And then we have uh, here in our media, you know, they, they look at these countries where this opposition is, you know, being getting empowered, especially by, from the United States. And they're saying, well, look, this is the result of socialism. <laughs> and they always point to, point to like, look, it's because it's a socialist government. And that's really what what is to blame. It's not the economic sanctions, right? Yeah, no, it's incredible. I mean, I actually heard an NPR story about a week ago. It was a pretty uh, lengthy uh, story about Venezuela and about the uh, hardships they're having there in terms of their medical system. And they managed to have this fairly lengthy report without mentioning the word sanctions even once. That's crazy. And yeah. It's just crazy. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, and, and this is a very standard technique that the U.S. uses to try to overthrow governments it doesn't like. And the media is very much complicit in it, in the way that we're saying. They play along with this game of the U.S. starving a country into submission and then blaming that country for starving. It's a quite insidious thing. Right. And the, the first time that the, the U.S., uh, really ran this playbook was in 1952 to 53 in overthrowing uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh in Iran. That was the first CIA coup um, in the world. And they did exactly what the U.S. continues to do today to these countries. They engaged in economic warfare against Iran. They had a blockade of Iran and its oil, um, caused huge amounts of suffering, of course, amongst the population. And this, of course, was in response to the fact that Iran had nationalized their own oil. Um, and at the same time, the U.S., the CIA would pay groups to protest and pay them to protest violently. So the whole point was to create instability and hardship, which gave the U.S. then uh, cover to support a military overthrow of the government, which is what exactly happened. And again, this playbook continues virtually unchanged. This is exactly what the U.S. is doing in countries like Venezuela, Nicaragua, Iran, Cuba. Um, and of course, it, there, there, there's a, a number of ways in which it's real insidious. So not only do they create problems of deprivation, of starvation, and then blame the country for starving, but again, they, they fund these groups, these opposition groups, many times that carry out 
you know, acts of violence and even terrorism against their fellow citizens and against their government. And then, of course, that government naturally reacts uh, to put down uh, that type of activity. And then the U.S. blames that government for being uh, authoritarian. Right. So the U.S. Right. creates the conditions of hunger, then blames them for that, creates a condition in which a government has to be more authoritarian to survive in truth, and then blames them for that. Similarly, during the Cold War, the U.S. would, again, do the same thing to these countries, uh, force a country to then turn to, to the Soviet Union or, the, or China or both for help and then blame them for being aligned with the Soviet Union, right? So Chomsky talks about this all the time. Um, you know, so it's this very insidious process. And again, it could not happen unless our media uh, went along with it. And uh, unless our media, you know, uh, uh, propagated these myths that are coming out of Washington about what's happening in these countries. But the media does a great job of that. They are very compliant. Um, and so that's what allows uh, these these coups uh, to take place. And the media, like you said, always makes it seem like, you know, it's just the government. We're just sanctioning the government or these few officials or this, you know, these companies when in fact it really is targeting um, the mass civilian uh, population and something that th that's really overlooked when discussing sanctions is that sanctions are essentially a sort of heist. Uh, the United States profits tremendously when it sanctions nations like Iran or Venezuela or China. Um, they serve, you know, as they serve, sanctions serve to justify and conceal theft through asset freezes and seizures at a rate only previously accomplished through outright invasion and occupation, you know. So, um, I, I read something um, online yesterday when I was researching this that um, the New York Federal Reserve Bank alone maintains $3.3 trillion in foreign assets from sanctioned nations. How was this accomplished? Yeah, well, what happens is, you know, because the U.S. Uh, is really the, the chief economic power and engine of the world and the US dollar is the predominant currency um, at least up till now that could, that could change soon but up till now or in, and certainly that's been the case since the end of World War II um, countries uh, you know invest and save money in in Western banks and US banks um, and many like for example uh, Venezuela, up till recently had a U.S. company called Sitco through which they sold their oil and gasoline uh, to the U.S. market. And so, of course, Sitco would have assets here and have monies here. And so what happens is um, when the U.S. decides to sanction a country, one of the things they do is freeze, and I'm making the quote signs around freeze, the assets that these countries have in U.S. financial institutions. And what that freezing many times means is simply stealing their money that they have invested right. here. And in the case of Sitco, for example, Venezuela's U.S. oil company, the U.S. not only froze their assets, they stole the whole company. They gave that company to their puppet, Juan Guaido, and Venezuela overnight lost its its largest single source of revenue for their country. Can you imagine that? And there's other examples. Um, in in England, uh, Venezuela had uh, deposited about 1.5 billion dollars of gold reserves in the Bank of England, the Royal Bank of England. When the U.S. began sanctioning um, Venezuela and uh, President Maduro was looking for sources of revenue, you know, to buy food and medicines for his people, he went to the Bank of England and said, hey, you know that 
gold we deposited there. We'd like it back. And the Bank of England said no. They kept it. Wow. Uh, by, by the way, if you're following the price of gold, it's it's doubled during this pandemic. So that $1.5 billion is now $3 billion of gold reserves that the Bank of England simply stole from Venezuela. This is just old timey imperialist theft. Uh, and it happens under the guise of, you know, claiming to care about, you know, the humanitarian situation in these countries. It's, it's absolutely pre preposterous. And that's what I was going to say is, you know, the way it's justified within the media and just in within public discourse is that this is you know, we are sanctioning these countries. We're stealing their money. We're preventing them from getting aid because we care. We care about these people because they have a bad government. Um, in your book, No More War, How the West Violates International Law by Using Humanitarian Intervention to Advance Economic and Strategic Interests, tell us about your use of the phrase humanitarian intervention. I mean, where did this phrase stem from? And if you could walk us through how it is sold to the public. Yes, well... I at least, you know, date it back in terms of modern times uh, to King Leopold II of Belgium when he, in the late 19th century, decided to personally take over uh, the Congo in Africa um, in order to uh, profit immensely from that country's valuable rubber supplies ivory supplies and what he did in order to get support around the world for this project to get countries for example the US which was the first country to recognize his sovereignty over Congo he went around the world uh, explaining that he was doing this for humanitarian purposes, that he was doing this to benefit the Congolese people and to protect them from enslavement uh, by Arab countries, which that had been happening. Um, and, and by and large, people believed him and, and even gave uh, money for this project. But what, it, what really happened is that over the next decades, King Leopold himself enslaved millions of Congolese people, men, women, and children, um, to work on these rubber plantations. And he killed about 10 million Congolese in the process. 10 million. This is fairly well accepted. I mean, that's a big, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. All in the name of human rights and humanitarianism. I believe, I'm sure there's other instances of this, but I, I think this is the real kind of first n real apparent use of this uh, humanitarian interventionism to, to not only advance, you know, a country's economic resource, uh, resources and, and interests, but to carry out real massive crimes. And since that time, uh, all the Western countries have engaged in this. You know, so, you know, very shortly after um, King Leopold took over Congo, the U.S., of course, uh, started the Spanish-American War under the pretext of liberating countries like Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines from Spanish rule. We claimed we were going to bring democracy to these countries. In fact, all that happened is we merely took over those countries from Spain. So instead of Spain dominating them, the U.S. dominated them. And in the case of the Philippines, the U.S. would go on and kill millions of Filipinos who initially welcomed U.S. troops as liberators but then began fighting against those troops because they saw, no, they didn't come to liberate us. They came to take over our country. 
And it's interesting. I, I, you know, there's always a few people, a uh, few good people in the West. Not many more than that usually. Uh, just a handful. <laughs> a handful who see through this. Right. And 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 one guy who did was Mark Twain. He eventually helps create. Uh, the American Anti-Imperialist Society. And he opposed, he comes to oppose the U.S. operations in the Philippines, though initially he bought into it and then supported it on the basis of, you know, spreading democracy. But again, he, he got wise. And he uh, opposed King Leopold's hold over Congo. And... Um, I like to talk about Twain because, you know, he's an example of a true intellectual, you know, who used his standing in the world to, you know, struggle against, again, imperialism using that name. I mean, can you imagine having an anti-imperialist league today? I mean, that would be seen as a really radical thing, right? Um but in any case, going back to this, so over the years, of course, all countries would invade other countries under the guise of some sort of humanitarianism or some sort of democracy spreading, that sort of thing. Um, of course, even Napoleon did that in the earlier part of the 19th century. In terms of the term humanitarian intervention, also known as R2P, or Responsibility to Protect. Those actual terms did not really come into existence until uh, the 1990s. And those were a creation of liberal Western intellectuals and political leaders who needed a new uh, justification for war. And why did they need a new justification for war? Because the Soviet Union had collapsed in 1991. After World War II, the U.S. waged its global wars, supported its surrogate forces throughout the world on the basis of fighting communism in the Soviet Union, right? That was the basis they claimed they were doing it. It wasn't the true reason. It, they were doing it to maintain hege world hegemony. But nonetheless, they claimed they were fighting communism in the Soviet Union. And the U.S. public, for the most part, bought that. They were fine with that. They supported that. But then the Soviet Union collapsed. And it's like, okay, well, now what are we going to do? Right? But there's no Soviet bugaboo that we can justify right. these war wars on. Right? And so you had people like Samantha Power and Bill Clinton... And Susan Rice, um, with the support of, of various other intellectuals, they come up with this idea, a very specific idea of humanitarian intervention, that now, now that the U.S. is the sole global power, we're going to go around the world and save it from genocide, and dictators and, hum and, and, and human rights abusers. Um, and again, it, it looked very similar to what had been happening for years anyway, but it was a new, uh, very explicit dogma that they created, a very powerful one that still, I think, is very significant in the world. Um, well, I think they put a big charming smile on, on the face of U.S. imperialism with Obama as its spokesperson to justify, um, you know, said humanitarian wars, right? Well, absolutely. And, if, and, and of course, you know, what happened under Obama was the NATO, in, you know, assault on Libya. Right. And the three people behind that assault according to the New York Times, the three main intellectual authors of that assault were Samantha Power, who is one of the intellectual authors of R2P, Hillary Clinton, and Susan Rice. These are the three uh, 
horse people of the apocalypse, right? But they are the three, you know, main intellectuals behind humanitarian interventionism. And they saw Libya as their chance to really put this idea into practice. And so the U.S. and other allied nations in Europe, under the guise of fighting this uh, strongman that they called, of course, Muammar Gaddafi, yeah. and preventing human rights abuses there and preventing an imminent genocide, they claimed, they bombed Libya from March of 2011 till October of 2011 when Muammar Gaddafi was finally captured, sodomized, and murdered. Of course, in the process of this, and I do talk about this a lot in my book, and I go into detail about this, so I won't go into minute detail here, but... Uh, if you look at the WikiLeaks um, uh, cables at this time, it's very clear that in particular the Hillary Clinton team, whose emails WikiLeaks has, they acknowledge amongst themselves that there really is no human rights emergency uh, to justify the bombing, but they have other reasons for doing it. So, of course, they push to go forward with it. But it's very interesting that, that in black and white, you see Sidney Blumenthal, who apparently was Hillary Clinton's main advisor on this, very openly saying uh, by, that, uh, you know, by the time of the bombing, any humanitarian concerns had already passed. And yet they go on and bomb for a number of months, right? And you also see in these cables uh, Sidney Blumenthal talking about the various interests being served by the overthrow of Gaddafi. And he talks about how uh, uh, France has an interest in Gaddafi's gold and Sarkozy, who was uh, president of France at this time, was interested in it. Uh, because apparently Gaddafi had given Sarkozy $50 million for his presidential campaign, which is illegal under French law. So Sarkozy literally wanted Gaddafi dead because <laughs> yeah, he wanted to kill him as witness. Italy wanted to get out of a deal it made with Gaddafi to pay reparations to Libya. Uh, arising out of Italy's colonial um, domination of uh, of Libya during the fr uh, first half of the 20th century. Uh, and the U.S. wanted uh, more access to infrastructure uh, investments in, in Libya. And, of course, the interest of oil uh, was always there as well. Uh, in any case, there were a number of reasons the West and these Western countries engaged in this assault on Libya. And while they claimed it was to defend human rights and prevent genocide, that wasn't truly one of the real reasons. In fact, ultimately, a genocide happens in Libya because of the NATO intervention. Right. So during that intervention and after the jihadists that the U.S. and NATO partnered with to overthrow Gaddafi uh, began a genocide against black Africans living in Libya. They depopulated whole towns of black Africans, uh, summarily threw thousands of, of people in jail because they had dark skin. And killed uh, a number of people because they were black. And as we know today, they also now are running slave markets in Libya. Libya now has public slave markets where you can buy a person, invariably a black person, 
uh, for $400 to be your slave. This was the result of the humanitarian intervention. It's really an incredible story and one that is rarely told. You know, Libya has been nearly forgotten by the press now. No mention of Libya at all, you know, after all of the damage. I mean, damage is like an understatement. I mean, Libya, as you described it, is now a failed state. Slave markets, it's like ground zero for ISIS, um, for the arms trade. It, it's it's ground zero for just hell, living hell on earth. And I'm so glad that you talked about Libya because the people there have been forgotten. And what strikes me as so disturbing is the fact that the Democratic Party and those, you know, those figures that you mentioned, like Samantha Powers and you know, Susan Rice and Hillary Clinton, have yet to be held accountable. And here we are again in these elections, and you know, people are saying, "Well, Obama, the good old days of Obama," as if this was isn't in our faded memory, you know? No, it's an incredible thing. It's, it's incredible. And so many people fell for it. Even Democracy Now! They were I know a cheerleader. They did. Yeah. yeah, they were a cheerleader for that intervention. Uh, not I, to mention, I, actually, course, I yeah. actually remember that Democracy Now! held like this anniversary um, special for the Libyan Revolution. And I just, it was like the most cringy thing I had ever seen. Yeah, and they are, you know, had been up to that point. One of the few real independent media outlets, you know, that I had trusted for a long time. And to me, that was a real sea change. And it does show, <coughs> sorry, how powerful this ideology of humanitarian intervention had become, especially yeah. when it was carried out by someone like Barack Obama, who was right. so beloved by uh, liberals. And as you mentioned, you know, his drone bombings have been forgotten, uh, his overthrow of Libya, uh, his coup in Honduras in 2009 has been forgotten, and the fact that he deported three million immigrants yeah. has been forgotten, or at least forgiven. Um, and it's, it's, it's just... <laughs> It's outrageous. You know, people have been very upset at Trump for what he's been doing to immigrants, and they should be. It's terrible, and it's unforgivable. But yet those same people, or, or many of those same people, were completely silent when Obama was doing the very same thing. And I think it shows how really bankrupt our political system is, that if you support one president, you know, whatever he does is fine. And then if, you know, so it, what what we're going to see, of course, is that if Joe Biden is elected, if he lives that long uh, and is elected, for example, <laughs> he's going to do the same things, right? I mean, he just, he just gonna, got endorsed by Hillary Clinton. And there's I even rumor, there's <laughs> rumors that she's going to be his running mate. I mean, can you that, imagine? <laughs> Incredible, right? And also, of course, isn't it also, and others have mentioned uh, Michelle Obama as a potential running mate. It also just makes me laugh, too. I mean, just the hypocrisy of all this. You know, I'll, I'll give an example. Like in Nicaragua, um, right now, people will often point to the fact that the president of Nicaragua, uh, his vice president is also his wife, okay? Which, you know, agreed. It's seems strange, you know, but at the same time, no one blanches at the idea that, you know, we've had two Bushes as president uh, in recent memory. We had Bill Clinton as president. Many people supported his wife to be president. Now they want her to be vice president. Uh, many people want Michelle Obama to be vice president or president after Barack Obama. Like we have family it's the same faces uh, over and over again. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we just, we don't judge other countries by the same measure we judge our own, right? We're much more forgiving. And I, actually, one of my favorite quotes ever is actually by George W. Bush, believe it or not. I doubt if he wrote it, but it's a great quote. And he said, this was in 2016 after he was president. 
president. And he said, we judge others by the worst of their actions, and we judge ourselves by the best of our intentions. And I thought that this pretty much summarized, you know, how our press operates and how American exceptionalism operates. You know, the U.S. can go in a country like Vietnam, kill millions of people, mostly women and children and elderly, uh, deforce their land, destroy their agriculture, and essentially say, oops, we're sorry, and people are like, ah, you meant well, that's okay. You know, if another country does that, of course, they're evil and genocidal, right? And it's just, it's amazing how our propaganda system works. It absolutely is. And it goes to show, just like you said, how powerful, um, you know, the selling of the, the, the humanitarian war propaganda sold to the public how powerful it is um, and how well it really, really works. Um, and, you know, something that I think a lot of people when talking about wars kind of overlook as well is the fact that, you know, modern, this is, this is modern day colonialism. Colonialism has never died. Like it's right. still active, still going on. Um, and I, I really want to talk about countries like Yemen and Somalia, two countries that I have personally been covering a lot for the past couple of years, just because of they've turned into humanitarian catastrophes. Um, they can be described as genocide, in my opinion. They have been described as genocide by many others as well. And, you know, you, you talked a lot about Libya, but Yemen and Somalia are like on a different level of catastrophe, um, not that they're, you know, in a better place or worse place. They're just on a different level. And I want you to talk about, you know, are they considered, I know you, I know, we talked about this yesterday when we were messaging each other, but are they considered humanitarian uh, wars? Because like in Yemen, for example, the United States is not 100% directly involved in the, the Saudi-led uh, coalition's war, but they're kind of enabling it, providing all of the, you know, the weapons, the training for the Saudi forces, they're basically not holding Saudi Arabia um, accountable. They're selling, you know, billions of dollars worth of weapons to Saudi Arabia. And they're enabling like this mass famine, this man-made famine um, on the country. Um, talk to me about these two nations and why they are also not very much covered. I mean, is it in the media? Yeah, well, let's start with Yemen, which I think, one, I know more about, but also... It really is the poster child for um, American aggression, American hypocrisy. So in Yemen, as you know, they are now facing a famine. They are facing the largest cholera epidemic ever known to exist in humankind. Uh Hello? Hello? Yep, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, sorry. Um, they are facing a huge diphtheria epidemic. And according to the UN, um, they've estimated anywhere between 10 and 21 million Yemenis may die as a result of all this. And this is all caused by a Saudi uh, UAE uh, uh, bombing campaign against that country, which has been supported from the beginning by the United States, including and beginning with by Barack Obama at a time when his ambassador to the UN was Samantha Power. And in fact, she intervened at the UN to prevent the Security Council from passing a resolution uh, which would have forced an investigation into war crimes in Yemen. So she aided and abetted this campaign, which continues to this day, and which may create one of the largest, if not the largest, genocides we've ever seen. 
and, and, and the reason it doesn't get much coverage by the U.S. media is for that very reason, because it runs completely counter to what the U.S. claims it stands for. The U.S. claims that it is the defender of human rights in the world, that it is the protector of the world against genocide, and yet the U.S. is aiding and abetting one of the largest genocides in world history, in Yemen. Um, and again, this began under Obama. And um, this should be on the nightly news every day, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yet it gets virtually no coverage because it's a very inconvenient war <laughs> to, uh, to the defense of American, you know, uh, foreign policy. Um, Somalia, you know, is a country the U S has been intervening in certainly back, back to the Clinton years. Right. Um, and he certainly began intervening there on the basis of humanitarian interventionism. Um, but really, all the U.S. has done is destroy any ability of Somalia to, um, to govern itself. There was one moment, it seemed to me, and maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong, but where they had a government. Um, and this was during the George W. Bush years, a coalition government of tribes that looked like it was going to be able to govern that country and manage that country. And w, George W. Bush overthrew that government, right? And really, since that time, it has not been functioning. And, and as you say, um, the result has just been uh, complete devastation to the population there. And again, we rarely uh, uh, talk about Somalia. Again, for that reason, it's not a, uh, a convenient example of, of U.S. foreign policy resulting in anything good. No, and I think, you know, after that overthrow of that government, you know, George Bush launched the war on terror and then bam, you know, these countries just plunged further <laughs> into... They plunge further into civil war and humanitarian disaster because now there's the U.S. involved in those countries under the guise of fighting terrorism, which is obviously like a farce because we all know that that has been used to just expand U.S. empire, expand uh, U.S. troops and occupation and just the continuation of pillaging um, of these countries. And, you know, I noticed a trend in everything that you've been talking about, I hope our listeners did as well. But it seems like Democrats, and I'm, I'm not, you know, saying that Republicans are not, you know, are not guilty of this either. But Democrats seem to be really good at selling these humanitarian wars. Um, and we have organizations like international bodies, uh, like the Organization of American States, or even Human Rights Watch, which is, you know, one of those organ organizations where they do really good on issues like maybe Palestine and, you know maybe they talk about Yemen, you know, once in a while. But then overall, these organizations um, basically end up being enforcers and mouthpieces for Washington's foreign policy. And can you can you talk about kind of how these organizations came to about? And if you have more examples, please share. Um, and how they really are just working hand in hand with uh, the U.S. foreign policy establishment. Yes, well, so these human rights groups um, like uh, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, um, first of all, and uh, the best person who describes this is a professor named Francis A. Boyle out of the University of Illinois. And what he talks about, he was actually one of the founding members of the uh, Amnesty International USA board. In the 1970s, he ended up quitting, um, frustrated with them. And what he says, and it's it's it should be kind of obvious, but it isn't necessarily to people, is that, you know, first of all, these organizations, 
which are huge. You know, they employ hundreds of people and they have, you know, um, reserves of millions of dollars to be able to send people all around the world to investigate, you know. Well, so the first thing they need to do, and this is what Boyle says is their first priority, is to raise money, right? And where do they get their money? They get it from, you know, big corporate donors like the Ford Foundation. And they get it from the U.S. government, like USAID, right? And so right off the bat, they are compromised to a certain extent because of where they get their money from. They don't get money from indigenous groups in Brazil or peasant groups in Guatemala, right? <clears throat> and so you always have to follow the money in terms of, you know, the, the uh, trajectory and the, um, the leanings of, of any type of group. The other thing that's important, again, Francis A. Boyle talks about this to these groups, is having a certain standing amongst government officials, media groups. Um, you know, they, they want to be considered uh, respectable uh, in so-called respectable circles, and they want to... Um, you know, get a seat at the table to talk to very powerful people. Well, again, that interest sometimes and many times collides with their duty to be objective in terms of, you know, their human rights reporting and how they, you know, what countries they focus on for their reporting. You know, if your goal is to be able to get an audience with the U.S. Senate. And I'm not saying it's a bad goal. Obviously, if you're going to be a human rights group, you do need to talk to those people. But to get that seat all the time, to get on NPR, to get in the New York Times, you have to have a certain um, outlook. And, and if it's too radical, and if it, it collides too much with the U.S. foreign policy, you're not going to get a seat at those tables. And so that also affects those groups. Um, also, you know, another consideration they have is getting very notable, so-called respectable people on their boards. Um, and again, that changes how they you know, report on things. And so, for example, Human Rights Watch had, and I don't know if they still do, but up till recently, they had a former Supreme Commander of NATO on their board. Uh, Sounds like a conflict of interest to me. Uh, of course. <laughs> Amnesty International USA, for a short time, uh, their executive director here, Suzanne Not. Uh, uh, Nostner, I believe I, I, I could be getting that name wrong it's in my book um, she uh, had been in the US State Department uh, at a time when we were uh, bombing Libya and she then became the head of Amnesty International USA so again uh, they want to be part of the establishment and in order to do that, they have to make incredible compromises, um, which affects how they report on the world, you know, and, and we see that, you know, there's very few human rights groups that have any type of um, world spotlight um, that come out of third world countries, right? I mean... It's there are human rights groups pretty much in every country, right? But you're not hearing those voices often uh, in the U.S. media, right, or in the halls of Congress. You're hearing human rights groups based in the West, funded by the West, populated by people from the West, and so na quite naturally. Uh, they're going to give a slant which benefits the West. 
um, in which assumes the West really is um, the the part of the world that is most upholding human rights. When in fact, I would say it's quite the opposite. And Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International are so trusted by the mass population uh, because of their standing and their position. Um, they obviously play a huge role in propagating the population in justifying and um, justifying these wars. Um, can you talk a little bit about the rise of neoliberal hipster <laughs> media like BuzzFeed and maybe Vice News that are kind of similar. They're on a similar trend um, as these human rights organizations where they're on the outside, liberal, progressive. They talk about sex, drugs, fashion, you know, all of these things that young people, millennials care about. Um, and then they have like these random propaganda pieces about, you know, we need to go support these opposition groups that, you know, obviously it's not maybe not mentioned in that article, that we're that the United States is funding to overthrow this government because it's a humanitarian disaster. Um, how do these, you know, these new neo the rise of this neoliberal hipster media uh, play? What role do they play in propagating um, the youth? Yeah, well, they're very critical in doing that. Um, and in fact, by and large, there's very few media outlets left that are running counter narratives to U.S aggression um in part that's because you don't have an organized left in the u.s you used to have it you don't anymore you know and there was an organized left to support these progressive outlets now there's not and so even outlets that used to be progressive like democracy now uh like nakla which reports on latin america they have over time become more uh, reactionary in their views of uh, other countries and, and other revolutionary movements that they used to support. Uh, Nicaragua is a classic case where you almost can't find any um, media outlet except very small ones that support the Sandinistas anymore, though they were very much supported by Nakla, for example, in the day. Uh, and why is this? So, again, part of it is we have an ideological vacuum in the U.S. There used to be a strong left wing uh, in the U.S., you know, represented by a number of different organizations. And so that, you know, you need that to keep people, uh, to, to give a perspective that people don't see every day, right? And so you don't have that as kind of a backstop against these different media reports. But also, um, how do I explain it? If we look at something like Vice, for example, as you mentioned, it's kind of this hipster uh, news source Um but it's not leftist, right? I think a lot of people think it is because, as you say, it kind of seems – it deals with kind of uh, maybe progressive social issues, right? But it doesn't support revolutionary movements around the world, right? And it still has this basic assumption that what we do in the West here is superior to what people do elsewhere, um, and so they're very quick to criticize um, revolutionary governments like the one in Venezuela and Nicaragua, for example, uh, because they don't match what they view to be, you know, kind of proper Western type governments. Uh, and again, with no ideological um, uh, substance. They, therefore, basically, ha their fallback position is the State Department position on these countries and on revolutionary movements, and it tends to be quite reactionary. Um, and again, there's just so little in the U.S. in particular to counter that, that 
you know, young people, I, I believe, tend to just be misled on these issues. And they don't have the interest that, that you know, when I was, I, I'm going to sound like an old man, I guess. But, you know, when I was a college student in the 80s, and we had this very strong peace movement and solidarity movement, you know, a lot of us were excited about the Sandinista Revolution, right? And about the, the guerrillas in El Salvador and about the PLO in Palestine, you know? And, and you just don't have a very strong movement in that regard to support those movements. And so you're left with this very mushy type of coverage, you know? Um, yeah. And then you see even someone like uh, at Democracy Now!, Amy Goodman, Again, without that kind of ideological support, uh, again, really just falling for this humanitarian intervention nonsense. Um, it's it's quite disturbing, really. Well, and that lack of excitement makes sense. I mean, my son, he's 10. He goes to school, public school, and his teacher is, you know, not his teacher, but maybe a lot of the kids in the cl in the classroom, they're so indoctrinated from the media, like the consolidation of the media and the rise of these like neoliberal, uh, pro Democratic Party, uh, pro State Department talking points. Media is everywhere. You can't escape it, and it's making its way into like kids' cartoons and YouTube videos where kids are watching, like young kids, like eight, nine, ten year old kids. Um, are active and it's really just crazy to see my own kid you know being bombarded with this kind of propaganda and then I'm on like the opposite end of the spectrum like hey don't believe this <laughs> here's you know here's what's really going on and these are just kids um, and they'll believe a lot of what they see hear, and and read online uh, which is really unfortunate um, and speaking of you know my son came home from school um, before the, before we got all got quarantined, maybe like a month or so before this, we got quarantined, he came home and said, um, that kids were making fun of his name because his name is Mohammed. And they were telling him, you know, who do you think you are? Um, who do your people think they are? You know, you know, our country is so strong. Like, you know, we're going to bomb Iran. Like we're not even Iranian, but they were like, just like talking in this very arrogant kind of way 10 year old kids about how you know they're going to be bombing iran <laughs> and you actually wrote a book called the plot to attack iran which in my opinion is probably one of the most important books you've written because it's really like a microcosm of just all u.s foreign policy and strategy and probably and how propaganda works to justify war um because you know iran has been sanctioned for over 40 years or about 40 years, and they've been victims of crippling economic sanctions, threats of war, targeted assassinations, the funding of, you know, often very violent opposition groups that act as fronts for U.S. interests and the flooding of their nation with refugees because of our wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, I feel like Iran has been hit possibly the hardest by U.S. imperialism. Um, they've even been accused of being the largest funder of terrorism in the world and developing nuclear weapons to destroy Israel, destroy the United States, destroy the world. <laughs> um, why is it that, what is it that makes Iran such a target that we have 10-year-old kids talking about it in classrooms? Um, and, you know, why has it been treated so harshly, do you think, compared to other countries? Well, there's a few reasons for it. I mean, Iran, first of all, you know, is a very historically important country. Um, it's one of the few countries in the Middle East that actually has existed for thousands of years, pretty much as an intact country, right? Most of the countries there, the boundaries they have now were drawn by colonial powers and those boundaries have shifted over time. Iran you know, Persia uh, has remained as a, a country, as a uh, civilization. Um, so it's important from that point of view. Of course, it has a lot of oil, and that, that's an issue too. But, um, you know, I think uh, 
that what has frustrated the West so much is it has never been able to, for a long period of time anyway, um, bring Iran into the Western fold, right? Iran is relentlessly dedicated <laughs> to being independent. And that is not permitted by the West, particularly by the United States. And so we have this very fraught history with Iran. Um, in the beginning of the 20th century, Britain um, dominated Iran, controlled its oil production and its profits from its oil, while 90% of the country lived in abject poverty. But again, very, sh you know, in fairly short order, the Iranians said, we don't want any part of that, you know. And so uh, they elected this prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, who nationalized the British oil fields. But there really were, of course, Iranian oil fields. And this really upset Britain. Uh, and they prevailed on the U.S. Um, to overthrow uh, the Mossadegh government. As I, as I noted uh, before, uh, the U.S. overthrew Mossadegh and then installed the Shah, a, a monarch, as the leader of Iran, and helped set up something called the SAVAK, which was Iran's security services. The CIA trained the SAVAK in Nazi torture techniques. Um, and, and the Savak really ruled Iran um, till 1979 in the Islamic Revolution um, in the interest of the United States. Um, and then in 1979, you had the Islamic Revolution, which overthrew the Shah and the Savak. And this was an unforgivable sin. Uh, as far as the U.S. was concerned. You don't go around overthrowing U.S.-backed dictators, um, which the Shah was. In 1978, a year before the Islamic Revolution uh, in Iran, Amnesty International rated Iran as having the very worst human rights record on Earth. And that's when it was a vassal of the U.S. And when... Iran had its revolution. Again, the U.S. just resented this so much that this very significant country in a very important part of the world went its own direction. And so the U.S. immediately began to attack Iran through various means. First of all, it supported Saddam Hussein's invasion of Iran. It supported Saddam Hussein's use of chemical weapons against Iran. That's largely been forgotten, right? Uh, as a result, that war went on for eight years, the Iraq-Iran War, and the U.S. at times supported both sides of that conflict. Can you imagine that? What is more cynical than supporting both sides of a war, right? But the U.S. did it to try to weaken both powers. And Iran survived that, and uh, ever since the U.S. has sanctioned Iran, threatened Iran, but it still hasn't been able to get Iran back under its thumb. And I, I think the U.S. just can't live with that. They cannot live with a country that has so defied it despite all odds, just like they can't live with Cuba for the same reasons, right? Well, and Iran is used as that scapegoat, you know, like for everything they do in the Middle East, the United States does in the Middle East, oh, well, we have to prevent an expanding Iran. And what exactly is Iran expanding? I mean, if you ask me, it sounds like they're spreading this idea of independence from U.S. imperialism and economic, um, you know, being a hostage of economic U.S. interests, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And they support the Palestinians probably more than any other country besides they maybe Syri Syria. 
Um, and that's another big sin. I mean, the problem with, with Iran is that, in addition to the things I've said, is that they are preventing absolute Western hegemony over the Middle East. You know, um, they are seen as a counterweight against Israel um, and against the Gulf states, which are now really lackeys of the United States. Uh, they're the one real holdout, as is Syria, though it looked for a time that Syria might be toppled. You know, that hasn't worked out. But um, the U.S. just cannot accept that sort of independence again in the Middle East because I think I think there's real designs on the West taking over the Middle East in a very concrete way I mean really using Israel as a means to do that this idea of greater Israel and Iran is a real bulwark against that I mean they're the only country Iran the, was the only country in the Middle East who's now of course with the exception of Syria like you said that is not allied with Israel or the United States, that literally celebrates Quds Day. <laughs> I mean, they have a day dedicated for Palestinian rights and liberation. Uh, when you have, then, then you, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have countries like, you know, Jordan, um, Egypt under Sisi, and then you have, um, uh, what, what do you call it? My, I'm having a, a fasting brain freeze right now. Um, then you have countries like Saudi Arabia who are telling Palestinians, they're literally releasing fatwas, telling Palestinians, you know, you don't, you need to stop resisting occupation. <laughs> just accept your, your occupier and just learn to live with them. You know, resi don't resist anymore. And so Iran really represents the only country that is legitimately standing up to Israel and kind of is doing it really in their face by celebrating Quds Day. And also by, you know, frankly supporting Hezbollah, which is also a right. very strong supporter of the Palestinian people. And again, it's not a coincidence that Gaddafi was also a strong supporter of the Palestinian people. And he had right. to be gotten rid of in part because of that. He was a huge supporter of the PLO, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you, you just see that uh, the U.S. demands complete hegemony. And in a country like Iran, it just, it defies the U.S. It will not be brought to bear, despite everything the U.S. has done to it. It's actually quite incredible. And Iran now pretty much produces nearly everything it uses, even its own nails. You know, it's had to become al almost wholly self-sufficient. Well, I think that's, you know, what happens when you sanction a country, they're forced into that corner. And I know that they became one of the largest manufacturers of automobiles and and many different industries that no other country in the Middle East can say that they went that far. And it ended up actually backfiring and creating a very strong working force in their country. Um, you you traveled to Iran, right? Yeah, I, I was there in 2017, summer 2017. Okay, so... When you went, I mean, what was it like? I mean, was it like how the media had described women are oppressed? Um, you know, there's a, these religious ayatollahs in charge who are just abusing the population. I mean, what was it like? I mean, it's an incredible country. Uh, first of all, I would say in the Middle East, women probably have about as good of a position in Iran as they do anywhere in the Middle East. Um, you know, women are represented in every economic sphere of, of Iran. Women are valued there. Um, you saw one of the, uh, I believe this young girl recently was ranked as having the highest IQ in the world. She, she's Iranian. And that scene is a good thing, right? Women drive there. Women are Again, part of the economy. They're part of science. Uh, women's intellectual development is valued there, uh, which you can't say is true in, in many Middle Eastern countries. I actually read, Dan, that Iran, the women in Iran have the highest rate graduating with PhDs in any other country in the world. Women are leading the way. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I did not know that particular fact, but it doesn't surprise me. I mean, women are respected in that society. And unlike in Saudi Arabia, where women have to totally cover up their face and their bodies, I mean, in Iran, you know, women wear headscarves, these light headscarves. Aside from that, they're wearing blue jeans and whatever, you know. Um, you know, it, it, it doesn't have a feel uh, that women are somehow second class citizens. That's not to say they don't have a lot. You know, women are in every country in the world have a lot to struggle against, right? And I don't want to, I don't want to minimize that, you know. But given the fact that women around the world have much to struggle for, uh, Iranian women are tre treated pretty well, you know. And um, and again, that's pretty evident in society. The other thing is, women. You'll see women in child, you know, with children at night walking around safely. Again, that's not true in a lot of countries. Uh, we can't even do that here. We <laughs> can't even cities. do that here. Yeah, of course. Of course. It's not safe um, in many of our in our cities here. The other thing people uh, would be surprised to know is that Iran has the sec second largest Jewish population in the Middle East. They have around 25,000 uh, Jews who live in Iran. There is a Jewish hospital in Tehran, which the Iranian government has given millions of dollars to. There are synagogues that operate in Iran. I visited one, in fact. Um, you know, it is not this monolithic, uh, you know, country that we are led to believe. It's a very, actually, pluralistic society. You have, of course, Muslims, you have Jews, you have Armenian Christians, you have some people that still practice the Zoroaster religion, which is thousands of years old. And Iran has been very good at, at preserving the artifacts and the buildings of all of these different faiths. I mean, that's what's amazing about Iran when you go there. You can go into these beautiful mosques, you know, but you can also go into these beautiful Armenian churches and see these Zoroastrian ruins. And I would say that there's certainly no country in the Middle East that has preserved uh, that type of, of history as Iran has done, mostly because every other country uh, has been invaded at one point or another by the West, and those artifacts in those countries have been destroyed. Iraq's a great example of that, right? Uh, in 2003, the U.S. invasion resulted in a mass destruction and looting of uh, artifacts. I mean, not just Middle Eastern artifacts. These are artifacts of, of Western civilization, right? Biblical artifacts. Um, and, in well, that, and, that, and yeah. that's part of that's part of um, occupation and war is that is part of the control over that society, isn't it? Is yeah. destroying those artifacts, right? Destroying their historical memory, right? And uh, that's happening in Yemen as we speak. Many UNESCO historical sites have been destroyed and continue to be destroyed. Look at Palestine. I mean. The goal is to destroy every historical memory of the Palestinian people. The, the best example of this, you might remember about a, a couple of years ago, there was a best-selling book on Amazon called uh, The History of the Palestinian People. And it was filled with 300 blank pages. And this was supposed to be a joke. And people liked the joke because they bought the book. <laughs> but I think this this was a revelatory thing, right? Because the idea was the Palestinians don't have a history and we're going to make sure that they don't have it by destroying it, you know? And and that's a, a very explicit goal of of Israel is is not just to destroy the Palestinian people, but to destroy that there was the memory of ever that there were Palestinians. I mean, that's how it's a genocidal project that we're talking about.
And this is being played out in various different countries. Um, and ironically, it's the West that's very much behind that genocidal project. And I say ironically because most people, again, think the West somehow is out there to prevent genocide. But, of course, no one does it better than the West, right? That's right. And, um, you know, we went way over time, by the way, but I'm not even mad about it because this has been such a a fascinating conversation. Um, I have certainly learned so much from you. Oh, Um, thank you. (laughs) Really, I have. And... um, You know, I think a lot of people are going to learn a lot when they, you know, pick up your books, um, especially The Plot to Attack Iran. I know you wrote another book, The Plot to Attack um, Venezuela. You've written books about, you know, the theft of elections around the world by the United States. There's a lot to unpack in terms of U.S. foreign policy and like just what is happening around the world and to truly understand it. And I just want to wrap up with this last question for you, just, you know. If you could, in just a couple of minutes, what responsibilities do Americans bear in resisting this U.S. war machine and its propaganda machine? I mean, how can they even resist it in a time like this? Right. Well, first of all, we we have a huge responsibility because and privilege at the same time. I mean, you know, it is our country that spends more money on war in the military than any country in the world. In fact, more than all countries in the world combined, right? The U.S., I believe, and and a couple international polls show that most of the world believes this, is the greatest threat to world peace. Given that, and given that our tax dollars go to this war machine, uh, given that Frankly, we receive some economic benefits from the U.S.'s pillaging of these other countries. You know, we ha- we have a moral duty to fight um, U.S. militarization. Um, the other thing is it's in our self-interest to do it because, you know, we're seeing right now during this pandemic, the U.S. does not have the resources for masks and ventilators. But it can fly, you know, jets over New York City to thank medical workers. It's completely bizarre. You know, we're a country whose priorities are totally upside down. And I think as a people, as a country, we can't allow this to continue. We have to reclaim this country for, for peace and for humanity. And that means fighting the war machine. Now, how do we do it? Yeah, how exactly do we do that, though? You know, many people are saying, well, do we just go out and protest on the streets? We can't even protest right now because of the shutdown. So (laughs) what can can we do? Well, that's true, though. You know, soon enough, we will be able to get back out on the streets. And I do think we need to build a peace movement that can take the streets. You know, we have done this at times, uh, probably most successfully during the Vietnam Uh, war period where you know you had massive unrest over that war and we need that type of organized unrest now um i think that that is critical you know if you want to do you know civil disobedience i think that's in order i think withholding your taxes uh from the government for its war machine is also something you can do. Obviously, that's illegal. And so, you know, I, I, I couldn't strongly encourage that. But I know people who do it. I had a friend in Dayton, Ohio. He was a farmer. And he used to pay his taxes in corn. He used to go to the federal building and just dump bushels of corn. Oh, my God. Because <laughs> uh, he was, he said, I'm not going to pay for the war machine. So here's my taxes in corn, you know. But So there's a lot of creative ways to do it. But a- another thing is we just need to to tell the truth. We need to get the truth out there about what U.S. war means. And we need to tell that truth to people in this country. We need to tell it to people thinking about going into the military. We need to, you know, organize people outside uh, military recruitment offices 
to hand out flyers telling people what, you know, it really means to go to war. You know, these are things people can do. Um, these are things that we have a long tradition. I, I tend to be very negative about the U.S., but the U.S. does have a long, proud tradition of that sort of anti-war activism. And I think we need to to build that up again. Yeah, we need to revive it. And it's, it's so crucial for uh, the access to independent media, independent watchdog media tr that's real, that's true, that's sincere, um, considering all of the consolidation of media and the control over the free flow of information, when it com whether it comes from social media censorship or whatever, or these smear campaigns that are coming from, you know, the neoliberal class against, you know, watchdog journalists or activists like yourself. I mean, we really have to get uncomfortable. I think that's, you know, what I'm hearing from you is we've we got to get uncomfortable a little bit to um, to show that resistance, to show that we're frustrated and mad. Um, it's it, it will, because true change won't come until we get uncomfortable and we have to be willing um, to do that. Um, Dan, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I, I really, really did learn so much from you and it's a huge honor to have you on our show. I really hope that we can have you on again. I mean, I feel like this conversation, we could, we could, we could probably keep going for a couple more hours. I think we could <laughs> easily. easily, easily, easily. Um, so you can find a link to Dan's book, no more wars and his other books, um, on our website when this podcast gets up. Um, that is a wrap for today's Mintcast podcast. This program is 100% listener supported. You can join the hundreds of financial sponsors who make this show possible by becoming a member on our Patreon page. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. <laughs>